Um, I am going to be the, the boring part of the evening. I'm going to read to you. So I have, I, I got some vague, vague thematic guidelines, and what I ended up with is something fairly old and something very, very, like, a few hours ago new. Um, I'm going to start with the old one. This is a short story that I wrote um, back in Portland as part of a, a residency that I did there. It's called Three Ways of Looking at Blood. I should say also, this is a 21-plus show. There will be swears. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Okay. <clears throat> is the werewolf thing a metaphor? Asked Hannah. Lacey ground out her cigarette into the curb. Why the fuck would it be a metaphor? <laughs> she was a year older than Hannah and a head taller, thin in a way that made her look sharp and dangerous, even in her baggy sweatshirt. I don't know, said Hannah. I mean, they're not real though, right? Lacey snorted, twin bursts of steam in the October cold. Whatever you need to believe, kiddo. Hannah hadn't even noticed the wolves when she'd started at PS 128. They lurked in the dark places in the halls, sat in the backs of classes, eyes bright and teeth bared, lean and hungry and angry. She had seen them for the first time a week into the semester when a junior in a letter jacket, John Seamus, although she hadn't known his name yet then, had cornered her against her locker. She'd been frozen until she hadn't, and then she'd been all teeth and elbows and speed and rage, and then John Seamus was doubled over on the floor spitting out blood. And that's when Hannah had felt it. She looked up, shaking, and seen a tall blur across the hall, eyes narrow, lips curled into half a smile. Lacey had sauntered over and stood there next to Hannah, arms crossed, not saying a word, just standing there looking down at the boy on the floor. He had looked up like he was about to say something, do something, but when he saw Lacey, his face changed, and he stood up slowly and turned around and walked away. You're okay, Lacey had told her. Hannah was still shaking, and her knuckles were starting to hurt, and there was blood on her white sweater. I don't know, she had told Lacey. She had wrapped her arms around her waist and leaned her shoulder into the cold metal of her locker door and wished as hard as she could to wake up. There was no one else in the hall, at least. No one who mattered enough to register, just blurs and murmurs. Lacey was still mostly a blur, too, then, except for the sharp grin and the narrow eyes. Red's a good look on you. Lacey had said with a nod at Hannah's ruined sleeve. Oh, Hannah had said, and took a deep, gulping breath and squeezed her eyes shut. And when she opened them again, Lacey was gone, and the blurs had resolved into other students talking, hurrying, jostling. And Hannah was alone in her white sweater with red on the sleeve and chest. The werewolves are a metaphor. <laughs> of course the werewolves are a metaphor. Werewolves are always a metaphor for anger deferred, for nature, an instinct caged by civilization, for sex and violence and death. It's all very Carl Jung, very Hermann Hess, very Duran Duran. <laughs> In a slightly different paradigm, very Ginger Snaps. <laughs> yeah, the rest of you can watch it later. <laughs> Hannah had never been in a fight until the day in the hall, and she still wasn't sure it counted as a fight, but she thought it might, and then she thought out of nowhere that she had liked it, and then she tried not to think about it at all. Hannah had never been in a fight, but she had been in sixth grade health class, and seventh grade, and eighth, so she knew that if you wanted to get blood out of white cotton without leaving a stain, you should rinse it in cold water while the blood was still wet, and if that didn't work, you could try lukewarm water with a teaspoon of ammonia, but no bleach. <laughs> she also knew how to hold her keys if she found herself walking alone at night, and that she should never walk alone at night in the first place, but sometimes these things were unavoidable and how to step with the kind of high-heeled shoes she never intended to wear to do a maximum of damage, and that you should always shout fire, but never reap. The next morning, the red on the sleeve and chest of the white sweater had darkened and set to a deep, rusty brown. Hannah wore it to school that day, too, and caught Lacey looking again from across the hall. And when Hannah caught her eyes, she curled her lips back into something between a snarl and a grin. Werewolves are always a metaphor, until they aren't. 
The boy who shoved Hannah into the cafeteria wall wasn't Jock Seamus, but he might as well have been, tall and broad and at least a junior, in a letter jacket flanked by two friends. She recognized one of them from her AP Calc class, and that felt like more of a betrayal than what the middle one hissed at her through his teeth. He had her by the collar of her shirt, and she knew what happened next until it didn't. The wolves closed in as a semicircle, and Hannah didn't even see them until she felt the grip on her shirt loosen, saw the boy from calculus glancing over his shoulder, eyes darting and suddenly uncertain. The boys scattered, and the wolves closed in tight around Hannah, Lacey's arm around her shoulders as the others shrugged against her, nuzzled her hair, all yellow eyes and sharp teeth, and an occasional glimmer of bright blue eyeshadow. One of them was wearing vanilla body spray, the cheap, too sweet kind, and Hannah could smell it lingering on her shirt even after they left her standing alone outside her fifth period history class. They were there again between classes, clustered around her in the hall. And after school, Lacey met Hannah at her locker and said, come on. And Hannah trailed after her out a side door to a parking lot. She sat on a bumper and watched while Lacey took, lit a cigarette and took a long drag and passed it to another girl, thinking about how they had practiced saying, no thank you, in gym class for parties and cars where the driver had been drinking and crack pipes. <laughs> the other girl offered her the cigarette. No thank you said Hannah. The girl shrugged and passed it back to Lacey, who took another drag. It's nothing personal, said Hannah, because she felt like she ought to explain. I just don't smoke. The girl raised an eyebrow. Her eyes were bright and pale brown, almost gold. It's cool, she said. This isn't a fucking infomercial. No one cares if you smoke. She was shorter than Lacey, but everyone was shorter than Lacey, with a Spanish accent in two men's flannel shirts instead of a jacket. Thanks, said Hannah, for earlier. Lacey's lips curled back again into that grim that was also a grimace. Hannah, right? She said. You should sleep over on Friday. In the yearbook, the werewolves are all slightly blurry. There's nothing supernatural about it. They just have somewhere better to be. <laughs> When you got it, did someone tell you you were a woman now? <laughs> they were sitting on the floor of Lacey's bedroom, dissecting Oreos, eating them a layer at a time. Hannah nodded. Her mother had said it, and her father, and then her grandmother on the phone that weekend. <laughs> Hannah had been three weeks shy of 12, and the idea had terrified her that you became a woman with loss in a rush of dark blood and nausea. Lacey laughed like a growl. Yeah, that's how they get you. <laughs> the werewolves are not a metaphor. The werewolves are teeth and blood, 14 years of frustration. The werewolves bleed the watery blue of tampon ads, and their only weakness is pre-1978 girl gang sexploitation flicks. <laughs> and when they're done with you, there will be nothing left but bones. It's not sexy or anything, said Lacey. None of that vampire bullshit. Wolves aren't like that. <laughs> not sexy, Hannah wrote down dutifully in her spiral notebook. <laughs> <laughs> that was okay. She wasn't too sure about sexy, anyhow. Are vampires real, too? She asked. Lacey laughed so hard she fell off the bed. Are you fucking kidding? Vampires are for girls who are scared to fuck shit up. <laughs> Hannah wrote that down, too. <laughs> this is the difference between wolves and vampires. The vampires are elegant, refined, the monster rendered seductive by a veneer of social acceptability. Vampires color in the lines. Vampires die counting grains of sand. There are no vampires in this story. At half past 11, Kate climbed through Lacey's window like it was her own, without knocking, without even a cursory scratch at the glass. Hannah recognized her, a senior, compact and dark, in a torn up varsity jacket. Gymnastics, Lacey had said, MVP, all state. <laughs> Will I be able to do that? Hannah had asked. Lacey had laughed and then coughed. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, unless you can now. 
Oh, said Hannah. Will it, I mean, will it change anything? When I'm not a wolf, I mean. Lacey had smiled that curling, toothy half grin. You'll always be a wolf. Kate moved like a coiled spring, tense and alert. Predator, Hannah thought. In the cafeteria, Kate had been the one who had stared down the boy in the letter jacket, and Hannah remembered how the other wolves had hung a little back while she closed in, giving her first pick. Kate, Lacey had said, was the mama wolf, the first one in Lakeview. How did she get bitten then? Hannah had asked. Lacey had given Hannah a funny look. She didn't. Kate was the first because she had figured out the secret, the infinite mutability of girls, the strobe fast flux of those precious few years of becoming. Kate, flying between the parallel bars, had flashed straight through the lie and realized that if you paid attention, if you took the rage and filed it to jagged points, you could tear straight through the frame. You're a woman now, Kate's mother had said, tearful when Kate's period finally came on the late side of 13. Bullshit, Kate had told her, and she had become a wolf instead. <laughs> Hannah thought it would hurt, and the bite did, but the rest reminded her of getting new shoes when you'd started to outgrow your old ones, the feeling of stretching and wriggling cramped toes. That the first kill is the hardest is a standby of monster stories. It's an appealingly facile idea, the last desperate struggle of man against the rising beast, the perseverance of decency. In truth, the first kill is seldom the hardest. Don't confuse inelegance with hardship. The first kill is communal, cooperative, jubilant. The first kill will always taste best, victory untainted by routine. Hannah had worried that the blood might make her gag, but she discarded that, that fear on the floor of Lacey's bedroom, along with her spiral-bound notebook and her white sweater with red faded to rusty brown on the chest and sleeve. The blood was warm and sweet and salty, and as she laughed at it, it occurred to her faintly, somewhere in the part of her mind that carried between shapes, that it would have tasted very different to a human tongue, or perhaps that the taste would have meant something very different to a human brain. And she was glad in that moment to be a wolf although she briefly missed her human fingers when a scrap of fabric stuck in her teeth. The blood is not a metaphor either. Or rather, the blood, like the wolves, is not solely a metaphor. Hannah had assumed that someone would notice, but no one did, or at least no one said anything. Her mother noticed that she brought friends around a little more and dressed a little less neatly and breathed a sigh of relief that her daughter's teenage rebellion took the form of ripped sweaters and not, at least not so far as she could tell, drugs or pregnancy. Hannah wasn't sure if anything had changed at school because she'd never looked up before. Maybe if she had, the boys in letter jackets would have avoided her eyes then too, but she doubted it. That is the end of that.